Okay, I'm going to shut up now. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at in a nutshell, past, present, and future. And I'm eager for any questions that you might have. And I know we got some outstations here, too, that hopefully might have some. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Mike Billups, uh, reserve uh, PAO, currently working the inauguration. Oh, Mike Billups. Uh, and I've done... Is this on? I've done a, a couple of SOCOM exercises the last couple of years in Europe, and I just wanted what, to get some of your thoughts on kind of the post-Afghanistan purple world in terms of what you see um, when we don't have hundreds of IAs going forward, yeah. how we can are likely to be involved in, in joint operations since it'll mostly be us and SOCOM, the only people really doing for deployed operations after 2015. Yeah, it's a good question. The, the short answer is I, I don't think anybody can know, but let me, let me just run that out a little bit. I think this is a great time to be Navy um, because uh, the, the war in Afghanistan is going to start winding down here as we get to 2014. There will be some presence on the ground post-2014. No decisions have been made about that. It'll certainly be smaller than what we have now, of course. Um, and it will be largely a train, and advise, and assist. So there will be, there's no question, it'll be a special operations kind of heavy focus. No, no doubt about that. Um, but the Army will be coming back into garrison, uh, and they'll be uh, exploring, my guess is, exploring some capabilities that, that, that they want to reinstill in, in the Army. They're going to preserve all their counterinsurgency expertise, and boy, nobody has learned that better than the Army. They've just done an eye-watering job, but they also have other capabilities that they want to get back to getting good at. Um, and the Navy will be still uh, globally and uh, globally deployed and extremely expeditionary, as will the Marines. The Marines also, uh, as you know, want to get back to rekindling uh, amphibious capabilities that they have not been practicing. And we got Marines, my young nephew uh, just uh, came back from Afghanistan, a corporal. Um, uh, he's gonna be leaving the Marine Corps probably in the next uh, six to eight months, never been aboard a ship. Uh, and, there's, and he's obviously just one of thousands and thousands of Marines who haven't had that experience. So this is a good time, and then with this, and with this uh, rebalancing towards the Pacific uh, and the increased focus that the president wants on the Asia-Pacific region, uh, that's, a, that's a Navy story, and we ought to be grabbing at that. So I don't know what the, the IA requirements are, as you know, continuing to be reduced. Um, and I suspect that whatever the IA footprint is in Afghanistan post-2014 is going to be small, uh, but there probably will be some demand. Uh, which will mean that in the reserve world, we're going to need to be, we need to kind of take a fresh look at, at sort of how were we doing it before 9-11 and what do we need to preserve about the way we were structured and the way you all were de deploying to support operations and exercises. Because I think uh, as we move forward uh, with this balancing towards the Asia Pacific, there will be an increased demand on that side of the world for reserve assistance uh, as exercises and operations increase there in that part of the world. It's a broad answer, but I think that's the best we can do right now. Uh, but I, I do, I'm glad for the question because I do want us to take a look at this Asia Pacific focus and really welcome it because this is, this is really, it's about us. That's a big old body of water um, and uh, we've got a lot to contribute in that part of the world. Sir, I just want to note that we have 112 people around the world to include Afghanistan, Gitmo, and number of fleets. Terrific. Um, one question that we have from Chief Petty at the 3rd Naval Construction Regiment in Port Wainimi. He wants to know, with one MC billet to a battalion, it makes it difficult to provide coverage when the CVs pull the MC into their mission many times at the expense of the public affairs. Right. Would it be possible to combine those MC billets to a CB in pace of of sorts that may um, that way there is a larger pool of MCs to perform the PA mission across the NCF. Wow, what a great question! Not even uh, never would have thought thought of that. Um, I, I, let me take that question, uh, uh, Master Chief, and let's take a look at that. I mean, if there's a if there's an issue supporting CB battalions, uh, we ought to we ought to see what the op what the options are, alternatives to help out with that. Um, I. Uh, think the world of the Seabees. They just do amazing stuff. And I can see very easily, given the, how hard they work 
and the sense of urgency with which they do it that they would be pulling in everybody and all hands to help out. Um, I will say this, uh, first of all, thanks for the question, but also thanks uh, for your service and for being willing to chip in and pick up a shovel or pick up a hammer and help out the CBs. Um, I know it's out of the skill set, but again, it's all part of being a part of a team. So um, while I get the concern and it's a fair one, I do applaud the effort and the willingness to chip in and, uh, and help the command. That's great. That's great. Yes. Sir Commander Hahn, F-35 Program Office. Um, we talked about being able to defend the Navy's program, but as public communicators, what is our obligation to understand our other services programs so that we understand, yeah. see our battle, and how we fit into yeah. the national defense priorities? Great point, great point. And uh, I didn't mean to suggest that, uh, that we do everything at the expense of jointness. Um, we are more joint now as a military than we've ever been before. I've certainly seen that now firsthand. Um, and uh, it shouldn't just be uh, about defending the program at the, at the expense of, of others. So we do need to understand uh, what the other services are asking for, what they need, and the degree to which there's interoperability built into that. Because as you know, there are many programs that are joint, and we do need each other. Um, so I think it's, it's a great point, and we ought to take the time out uh, when we're getting ready for budget season in February to skim through the other services' budgets too and, and see what, the, uh, what they're asking for and what the potential crossovers are. Absolutely. Uh, it's a great point. I did not mean to suggest that we, you know, that we just work on ourselves and, and nobody else, all, although you know, we, we do have that primary obligation. So, What else? Sir, we have a question from Lieutenant Commander Michael Dean. He's with the Afghan Public Protection Force Advisory Group. I know, Mike. <laughs> he says, Admiral Kirby wrote his Naval, uh, Naval War College thesis that oh, Navy God. Public Affairs would have difficulty being, uh, being taken seriously until it became an operational function yeah. because operations was where all the money was. Does he still believe this is the case? <laughs> <laughs> My homework is coming back at me. <laughs> Yeah, I do, actually. I wrote a paper that said public affairs should be considered an operational function of war. And I still believe that. In fact, I believe it even more strongly, having gone over to Afghanistan for a couple of months to work for General Allen. Um, I used to think, when I came in um, to, to public affairs, I was, uh, I, I was, look, it wasn't something that I dreamed of doing. Uh, in fact, uh, how many people know Jamie Graybeal? Yeah, well, Jamie and I, and I'll get to the answer in a second, but Jamie and I were at the Naval Academy teaching together, and uh, we were pretty sure we didn't uh, want to go to stay surface warfare, but we weren't really sure what we wanted to do instead. So we took a pie plate, paper pie plate, and we drew pieces of pie on it, and in each slice of pie, we put a different community in the Navy that we could transfer into. <coughs> Intel, crypto, you supply it, public affairs. And every day, we had a little tongue depressor that we stuck to the pie plate, and we spin the tongue depressor, and whatever it ended up on, you know, we said, okay, that's it, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> and then we never did anything about it. Well, one day, we shook hands, we said, this is it, today's the day, wherever the tongue depressor lands, man, we're putting our papers in. <laughs> Landing on public affairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so here I am. Uh, and, um, <laughs> So I used to think for a while when I came in, you know, we were both, because it wasn't something that we had like, dreamed of doing, I mean, we were, we were both suitably skeptical, I think, uh, when we came in. And, you know, we, we used to say, gee, you know, every public affairs officer in the Navy could probably drop dead and the Navy could still do its job, right? I don't believe that anymore. Uh, and I haven't believed that for a long time. We are vital to the effort whether it's on the ground or at sea, in the air, we are vital. And I, I have seen that so many times, time again. The two months I was over there with General Allen was uh, just some of the best times I've ever had, not in terms of I mean, the severity of the issues, I don't mean to take those lightly, but to see how critical the public affairs effort contributes to our ability to fight that war. It's, it's, it's vital. Uh, and so I believe even more strongly now that my paper was accurate, that, uh, that we should be considered an operational function and we should, uh, we should be resourced to that effect, we should be at the table to that effect, um, and, uh, and we should be driving ourselves to that effect. And you should be asking yourself, you know, how am I contributing to the effort of the command, whatever that is. When I'm driving home at night, uh, 
I know this will sound corny, but it's the truth. I'm not going to lie. I ask myself three questions. Uh, what am I doing? What am I not doing? And how do I make up the difference? Uh, you got to constantly sort of push yourself to think about what you're doing to make the command better. And uh, so, yeah, I, I absolutely stand by the thesis. And the paper got an A plus, so <laughs> it just tells you how great it was. <laughs> Anything else? We got any more out there? Do we have Ensign Jason Tross? He's a PAQC student at Dinfos. Yep. He says, can Admiral Kirby speak to the current future fiscal landscape as it pertains to our public affairs communities, both active and reserves? Example, training, operational support, equipment, and manning. Not with any real intelligence, I can't. I, um, that's something that uh, the command, uh, the Master Chief and I have talked about a lot. I, that's something I really want to get into, is understanding our, the, the structure, how we're resourced, where the gaps are, what we need to do going forward. Um, it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer, but I can tell you over these next few months, I'm going to be focusing pretty heavily on just that issue. Just that issue. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I'm at the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command. I yep. mentioned you're a history major. Yes. Uh, what I've learned in the last year is just uh, we've been drawing more and more with our history, and where we have issues is where don't forget command operations reports and stuff like that. So we're where do you see uh, an increased emphasis and interest, clearly with the CNO, yeah. on uh, understanding more about our history, not just what's right in front of us, but really where were we before and helping to yeah. draw that in uh, to educate our bosses? Yeah, it's interesting you should mention that because in my, my, my own notes to myself, when I talked about my, prior, my second priority about defending the budget and the program and the capabilities that we're trying to, to develop and preserve, I wrote Heritage down there as uh, one of the supporting arms on that. I mean. It's a, it's a struggle for us. It always has been. We are, America is a, um, a continental power with maritime responsibilities. We have been throughout our history. America and Americans have been traditionally closer to their army, their ground forces, than they have been to their navy. Um, it's, again, not right or wrong. It's just uh, who we are as a people. Um, unlike, say, Great Britain, which is um, a maritime power, who has had, over her long course of history, uh, continental responsibilities. I just finished reading a terrific book called To Rule the Waves. I highly recommend it if, you, uh, if you're interested. It's a history of the Royal Navy, but it really talks about how the, the, the Navy uh, in England's history uh, became one and the same with, with the heart of the country. I mean, and in, in today, the Royal Navy is, is, uh, is beloved. And it's not that American people don't love us or cherish us or value us. They do. I mean, they, they, and they prove that every year through the budget that we get. Um, but, uh, but we do have some, some work to do uh, in terms of um, uh, trying to find ways to, to plug America into our heritage and our history uh, so that that awareness is higher and better and maybe even helps us prove the kind of capabilities that we want to get today. Um, you know, there's old, the old saw, you know, you want a new idea, read an old book. And um, there's all kinds of examples from our own history. And I taught naval history at the academy. There's all kinds of examples from that that we can draw on today. Um, I know the secretary uh, likes to put historical references into his speeches. I think that's terrific. And I know the CNO is committed to uh, particularly the War of 1812 commemorations, which, again, offers a terrific opportunity for us to leverage some of that to help us. Now, Denny showed me some Gallup results that were uh, pretty interesting. You guys may already know about this, but the nutshell is uh, for like these War of 1812 commemorations, to the degree that people actually came out and got to see and experience our sailors and our ships and the heritage of the War of 1812, their awareness and appreciation of the Navy increased. To the degree they didn't come out, whether they just got it through the media or they just heard about it word of mouth, I mean, their awareness and understanding of the Navy didn't move at all. So it really is, it's really about touch and feel and finding ways to get out there. I mean, really out there. And that's why our outreach efforts are so important. Uh, we do, we have an illustrious history. We have a lot to be proud of. And I, I, I think uh, we don't necessarily take advantage of it as much as we, sh as much as we should. Uh, there's just uh, terrific lessons there. And we are, whether whether many people believe it or understand it or not, we are a maritime power. We are a sea power. We have long coastlines on 
um, on both sides and in our underbelly, and we have huge maritime responsibilities in the world. There's no other navy uh, in the world more capable or 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 as big uh, and powerful. So we've uh, we just have to find ways to help connect them. We just it's it's really really important, and I am going to look for ways to do that. Yeah, good question. Yeah, sir, uh, Bill Urban, uh, Surfland. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, career path priorities and jobs that you think are important to, to get to as you uh, move, move through the ranks? Well, as, I, as I said, I didn't have any choice. So um, let, me, let me, because I don't have a lot of experience in a leadership role in the community, it's, let, me, let me try to put it through the lens of, of, of how I saw it coming up and what I valued. And, Again, take this with a, a grain of salt because not everybody can do every job. And there's no such thing as a bad job. Uh, you know, I heard that a lot growing up. Oh, yeah, just take the orders there. It'll be great. It's no such thing as a bad job. And I always thought they were just telling me that to shut me up and get me to go. <laughs> and, but it's true. It really is. It, it's how you do in the job that matters most. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're all good. You can make them all really, really hard or you can make them all really really easy and go home at four o'clock if that's what you want uh, it really depends on how you approach it i always found um jobs where you, you need a mix of jobs where you are you are the pao uh, and i mean this on the enlisted side and the civilian side as well this isn't just about the officer corps where you are running an office you are running a shop even if that shop is you and one other person or you and nobody else where you are the consultant um, I think you need a good mix of those. I think you also need a good mix of jobs where you're on a staff uh, and you're working for senior PAOs in a group of other PAOs because you're going to learn things from the experience of your seniors. You're also going to be forced to compete against your peers. That's important, a, ch a chance to, to break out over time with your peers and show what you're really made of. Um, you need a good mix, I, th I believe, of a float and a shore. And I realize for us in public affairs, uh, there's not a lot of afloat opportunities. I, I don't want people to read too much into that. I mean, there's 11 carriers. Not everybody is going to get the opportunity to be a carrier PAO. There's only so many ESGs. Not everybody's going to get a chance to do that. Um, but if it falls in your lap and you have the opportunity, phew, grab at it. Take it. Because it's an amazing experience. It'll teach you leadership and operational relevance that you're not going to get anywhere else. If it doesn't fall in your lap, if it doesn't go your way, don't fret over that. Just do the best you can where you're at, and you'll, 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 you'll be fine. You'll get noticed. Uh, you'll develop those relationships, and you'll be just fine. There are lots and lots of public affairs officers who have done very, very well and ro risen to very high levels in, in the community, again, across the board, um, who, have, who never got a chance to do that. But I do think trying to find a mix of a float and a shore is good. If you can't do that, at least try to get tours on the waterfront as much as you can. You're going to need a mix of staff, headquarters, and uh, and waterfront uh, because you want to you want to you don't want to lose that connection to the fleet too much. And frankly, that's one of the things I was really worried about coming into this job was it's been a long time since I've been near the Navy and near the waterfront. Lastly, I'd say don't issue uh, jobs in Washington. Um, and I know I'm speaking to people that are here in Washington right now, but I mean, it's, uh, there's powerful opportunities right here um, at, at all kinds of different levels. Um, some of the hardest jobs I've had, but I think looking back, the most influential and the best jobs were right in Washington. This is where the decisions are being made. If you want to be an advisor and a consultant and you want to develop your instincts and help leaders make these tough decisions, you got to be here at least part of the time. You have to live in this highly charged environment. Um, it, is, it is not the Disney world you know, that some people joke about it being, where you, know, you spend all your day working and to what effect and nobody cares and the fleet doesn't really, you know, it, that's not true. The decisions that they make in this building, uh, in this town, are the most important decisions that are made in the military establishment, oftentimes. Um, and, uh, and the leaders that you're going to meet and uh, interact with here uh, these are men and women that are, are going to be going out and commanding forces uh, afield and afloat and also coming back here to rise to higher levels. You can learn so much from them. So um, don't turn your nose up to Washington, D.C. duty. Uh, 
don't get too married to it either. You don't want to be here uh, if you can avoid it. And I, I know I didn't, but you don't want to, you know, if you have the opportunity to leave after a while, you should do that too. Because you want to take all, I mean, it, the idea is, is taking the, the value of each job to the next one and learning from it and then applying it at the next one. Um, try to fill the air in that balloon at the higher level if, if you can. Yeah, does that answer your question? It's really about balance. And I, you know, I think it would be very difficult for us to say, here's the flow path, boom. And everybody has to do that. Uh, because we're just a, we're a diverse community. I want to preserve that diversity. And I, I think diversity rests on good balance. Yeah, we've got to go. One more question, anybody? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Shari Coltler, I'm the deputy PDA over at UMED. Yeah. Um, we focus a lot on HADR in Navy medicine, obviously, with our counterparts in MSC. Um, and with the global force for good, the message really resonates with folks. But some of the criticism we get is that we don't focus domestically. Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't know if people know this, we actually have several domestic humanitarian assistance missions, including Alabama Care that just took place in March, Arctic Care in Alaska, Tropic Care in Hawaii. However, no public affairs assets get dedicated to these missions. And they are essentially like mini continuing promises or Pacific partnerships. And I guess. What can we do to correct that and get dedicated assets? We've started sending some MCs, but we only have so many in Navy yeah. Medicine. Great question. Let me, let me, I owe you an answer on that. I don't know. Um, I honestly didn't know about those domestic efforts. I think that's terrific. So, I mean, I had no idea. Um, so let me, let me uh, look at that and see if we can get you a good answer. If we can apply resources to help you out, we'll do that. Well, listen, I've, I've gone longer than I should have, and I apologize. Um, uh, I really appreciate you devoting an hour of your day to me and let me do this. And if this is useful for you and you liked it, I would like to continue to do it every now and then uh, because I just, you know, you, you never know where a good idea is going to come from or, an, or something that we need, to, we need to focus on. So thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for being so kind and welcoming me. And uh, I promise I'll work hard for you. I can't promise I won't screw up. I can't promise that I won't let you down at times, but I can promise you that you'll have 110% of my effort every single day, and I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to serve with you. Sir, for our online audience, can you let them know that we'll get back with the questions? Yes, for our online audience, we will get back to you with <laughs> answers to your questions. Is that good? Thanks, everybody. Please carry on. Carry on, please. Thank you.